Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're glad you're here. You may have some memories or thoughts of what church is really all about. Is it a place to get married? A place you go when someone dies? A big potluck? Sometimes with that mystery dish. Bible stories on a flannel board? A place to sing hymns? It can be some of those things, but it's really learning to love God and to love others, seeing our relationships with family and friends grow stronger, serving our community, and a place to find hope in a world facing trouble. Also that we can share the incredible good news of Jesus with others who need this good news just like we do. We believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again to save us all, bringing us new life, healing, and peace. If it's been a while since you've been to church, or it's your very first time, or you're here every Sunday, no matter where you come from or where you've been, we welcome you to our church. Good morning. Welcome to this time of teaching in God's Word. I'm so glad that we can be together in this moment. God has so much to say to us, especially beginning today and next Sunday. For the next two weeks, we will consider five questions for self-examination. Five questions come before us from specific passages of the scriptures that will encourage us to take a real close look at where we are spiritually and who we are as followers of Jesus. Abbot Moses, a 10th century figure from church history, once made this observation. They who are conscious of their own sin have no eyes for the sins of their neighbor. Now, I love this statement that reminds us that the more we take a look at who we truly are spiritually, the less time we will have scrutinizing the lives of those around us. So today, I invite you to join me in taking a close look at who we as individuals truly are concerning the truth of Jesus and our lives as followers of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, the Apostle Paul, that beloved first century pastor of the early church, reminded the congregation in Corinth to examine themselves concerning how they were participating in public worship, especially how they were participating in communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 all the way to chapter 14 presents a very large context that instructs us on how to properly participate in public worship. But in Paul's day, there were those who were actually corrupting the practice of communion. Can you imagine this? But in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, Paul makes this statement, let each one examine themselves. So before you and I can take a step publicly to participate in any form of, of church life, it becomes very important that we examine ourselves. Before we publicly identify ourselves with the church and with Jesus, we need to take a strong look on the inside. Before we preach, before we teach, before we sing, before we correct others, but before we stand and serve in a visible way, we must examine ourselves to make certain that our lives are truly where they need to be concerning the truth of Jesus and our calling to follow him. So today we begin a journey of this self-examination and we'll look at two questions today and three questions the next time we're together. So let's look at two specific questions concerning our self-examination. The first question will be built upon an Old Testament passage and the second question will be built on a very familiar New Testament verse. So to begin with, question one, very simply termed, do you truly seek God with all of your heart? Psalm 105 verse 4 proclaims, search for the Lord 
and for his strength. Seek his face always. We are called to seek God and to seek him with all of our hearts. Now, as I study the Old Testament, I find that there are two significant occasions where God's people sought him and sought his face and sought for his presence. One occasion reflects the need for repentance. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God called for his people to turn from their wicked ways and to seek his face. And so one calling that God's people had and that we have to seek God's face comes at a time of, re of repentance when we recognize our sin and, and when truly recognizing our sin, we, we cry out to him for, for his forgiveness and for his cleansing. That becomes a way that we truly seek the heart of God. Another occasion that we find in the Old Testament concerning our call to seek God with all of our heart references not just a time of repentance, but a time of worship. Psalm 105 reflects such a time. Look to the Lord. Look to his strength. Seek his face always. Psalm 105 commits the psalmist and commits all the hearers to the psalm for the purpose of praising God and worshiping him in recognition of his faithfulness. So whether you are in a moment of repentance or in a moment of worship, the calling remains clear. We are to seek God with all of our heart. How do we seek with our whole being? Because sometimes such a question may come easily answered in our own minds. When facing the question, do you seek God with all of your heart? Certainly most of us might answer quickly, well, yes, I would like to think that I do. But instead of assuming that we are seeking God with all of our hearts, may we take a close look at this key verse. Look to the Lord. Look to his strength. Seek his face. Always. May we judge how we are seeking God by the truth that stands before us. Now, do you truly seek God with all of your heart? In Psalm 105, beginning with verse 1, we're given three specific ways that we are called to, uh, to seek God with all of our hearts. So the big question is, how do we know we're seeking God with all of our hearts? Well, there are three answers. Answer number one, do you truly seek God with all of your heart? We know that we do when we are seeking God with all of our heart concerning him as our single focus. With all of your heart, in verse 1 of Psalm 105, represents a single focus, meaning a single affection. This indicates that our affection for God is not in competition with other affections in our life. Over all things, we seek God purposefully. There is no competition. There remains no negotiation. So the emphasis lies upon us over all other things in our life, seeking God and seeking his face. Now, when I read in Psalm 105 that we are to seek the face of God, I'm reminded that in the Hebrew language, the, the description and the expression of face always indicates presence. And so when we are called to seek God's face with all of our heart, we're actually called to seek his presence, to be in his presence. And one way that we can know we're truly seeking his presence with all of our heart is to understand that he is our single devotion. He is our ultimate affection. Our affection and our love to be with God should not simply describe God as number one with there being other affections that are close, two, three, and four. No. God is our ultimate affection. Our desire would be to be in his presence. Now, listen to Psalm 105, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Proclaim his deeds among the peoples. The term peoples is very interesting here. In this and many other Old Testament passages, the idea of the peoples can actually reference pagan nations. And so the psalmist calls for the worshipers to, to seek God against all of the pagan influences around them. Seek him among the peoples. Now, you and I live in a day when we are among so many different influences, and our calling becomes 
a calling to seek to be in God's presence, regardless of how many other affections are, are calling out to us. I, I love that verse in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, when the church at Ephesus is being described as having lost their first love. Now, that is a negative message. But the reason I love the description there is because we're reminded that although we, at the moment that we learn of the love of Christ and place our trust in him, our, our love and our affection seems to be high. But for many people, that love for Jesus fades over the years and can turn into works where we're just simply busy about serving Jesus without a deep affection. We're well, here in Psalm 105, verse 1. We are told and called to seek God's face, to seek his presence, to yearn to be with him, even over all of the pagan influences that circle around us. So how do we know we're truly seeking God with all of our heart? When he becomes our single affection, our only chief affection, when we're truly desiring to be in his presence. Well, look at the second uh, way that we can learn from Psalm 105 that we're truly seeking God with all of our heart. We, we seek him with all of our heart when we recognize the covenant relationship. With all of your heart represents the covenant relationship God has with us through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, that covenant relationship can be expressed in such terms that we find in Psalm 105, verse 2. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell about all of his wonderful works. Now, focus on that phrase, all of his wonderful works, for this demonstrates the narrative of God with his people. Any time in the Psalms or throughout the Old Testament when God's people were called to remember his works, the calling actually referenced their uh, account of God's faithfulness in the journey of their lives as his people. This references the covenant God had with his own. So when we recount the wonderful stories of God's faithfulness to us, we're recounting his, his goodness, his, his fathership, his provisions, his presence with us through Jesus Christ. And so how do we know we're seeking God with all of our hearts? When we are focusing on the covenant relationship with all of your heart represents a response to the true relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ, mirrored here in Psalm 105 as the covenant journey that God had with his people. Remember all the ways that God has been faithful to you. And through Christ, we see his love for us, and we know the covenant, his promise relationship is with us through Jesus. That should become the seedbed for how we seek God's presence. God is not interested in you and I seeking his presence with a mere 10-minute devotion so that we can say, check, we spent our time with God for the morning. No, God is interested in meeting with us in the early morning light, in the business of the afternoon, and even late in the evening. Our desire should be to walk constantly in his presence because the covenant relationship binds us together and brings us together as, as father with his child. And through Jesus, we are made to be children of God and that covenant relationship becomes real. We're seeking him with all of our heart and we're not simply checking off the task of Bible prayer, reading, or church attendance, but when we are truly desiring to be with God, our Abba Father, and to be in his presence. A third way that we can answer the question, how do we know we're truly seeking God with all of our heart, is this, with all of our heart can also mean focusing upon his name. Listen to verse 3 of Psalm 105. Honor his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Did you hear that call? Honor his holy name. The idea of name in the Hebrew language rep represents character, the fullness of God's nature, his majesty. And so we truly seek God with all of our heart when we are drawn to him through observing his greatness and his majesty. How can we not bow before him when we see the glory of his being and his nature? And through Jesus, we are told that the fullness of God's glory is manifested in the face of Christ. We're told that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And so the name of God, we focus upon his name, representing his character, his nature, demonstrating the fullness of his, of his majesty. That becomes our focus as we seek God. We're not seeking God out of routine. We're not seeking God out of a liturgical posture only or out of religious expectation or ecumenical participation. No, we're seeking God because we see his majesty and his glory and we're drawn to him. How can we resist the beauty and the presence of God made known through Jesus? So uh, verses 1, 2, and 3 of Psalm 105 
reminds us of how we are to seek God with all of our heart. These are the measures, the metrics that help us to determine if we're truly seeking God with all of our heart. And then the grand conclusion in verse 4 is obviously, look to the Lord and seek His face. Seek His presence always. I love the, uh, the classic statement from Thomas Akempis in his wonderful writings, the, the Imitation of Christ. And I just want to read one quote from his writings. If you seek God and God alone, you will gain that deep happiness that becomes the promise of all meditation. Seeking God alone becomes the only way that our hearts are truly fulfilled. So we've addressed question number one. Are you seeking God with all of your heart? Are you seeking him alone as your passion, as your desire? Do you truly yearn to be in his presence? Not because it becomes an expectation of, of religious routine or even of Christian expectation, but are you truly desiring to be in God's presence, to seek his face because of your relationship with him, because you're yearning for him and, and you're saying no to all the distractions around you. You're, you're seeking his face and you're, you're desiring to be in his presence. Oh, what a beautiful reminder from Psalm 105 that we are to seek the presence of God continually. Are you seeking God with all of your heart? Or has your relationship spiritually with God become a thing of routine? a thing that is cold and indifferent. Oh, I pray not. I pray that you're seeking God with all of your heart, and I pray this first question excites you to a deeper understanding of what it means to seek God with, with all of your heart. And then we turn to question two. And this will be the final question that we address in this moment of teaching. Question two. Now, we move now to the, uh, to the New Testament into an extremely familiar verse. Uh, but here's question two, and... and in a form that will represent the verse that we're drawn to in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've just discerned how our love for God and our desire to live out the, our relationship with him through Christ to, to be the reason we desire to be in his presence. So now let's look a little deeper. What transacts in our lives because of our faith in Christ? Who are we truly uh, living as when, when it comes to faith? Uh, so here's question number two. Which best defines your life? Striving to be like Christ or in Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 announces, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. The new has come. What best defines your life? Striving to be like Christ or in Christ? There will be those who will say, well, I thought both of these options were the same. Hardly. You see, the, the scripture tells us here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you're in Christ, you are a brand new creation. What we understand is this. We will never be fully like Christ until we're with him in heaven. Scripture is clear on this. But we are to strive to, to live out his, his love and to, and to live out our lives in honor of him. We're to strive for this more and more every single day. But if your life is only defined as striving to be like Christ, then perhaps we've missed a very key ingredient of our salvation, our status. You see, there is a significant difference between striving and status. Yes, we are to strive to be more like Christ, but spiritually speaking, when our faith is placed in Christ, we're given the status of a new creation. We know we're not perfect in that new creation, but our status, meaning that we are now right with God, uh, uh, announces that we are a brand new creation in Christ. We are not partially made new. We are not simply given a, a new name or a new perspective. We're made brand new. And so I pray that, that your life as a follower of Jesus becomes defined more by status than striving, even though we will strive every day to be more like Christ. Because again, we will not be perfect until we're with him in heaven. But our striving should not be 
the only defining measure of who we are as Christians. Our status becomes the defining measure. We are, because of Jesus, made brand new in a relationship with God. This becomes an, an exciting and an overwhelming uh, truth for you and for me. Now, to make certain that we understand our lives in Christ, I'd like to share with you seven facts of a life lived in Christ. Now, I'll share these with you. You may not uh, be able to recall all of them, and you may not be able to record all of them, but I pray that you'll listen to how the Scripture defines that we are indeed in Christ. Seven facts of a life lived in Christ. Fact number one, if anyone be in Christ, that person is a new creation. What an amazing fact. We are, we are a new creation because of the cross. And so fact number one of a life lived in Christ, we recognize the purpose of the cross. We recognize what Christ has done on the cross to bring us a brand new life. And so, yes, we recognize the purpose of the cross. Fact number two, our sin debt becomes canceled. To be in Christ indicates that our sin debt is canceled and the brokenness of life caused by sin has been restored. This is not because of any good thing on our own. This results in the grace of God, which has changed our condition from condemnation to brand new. This becomes the result of Christ working us through his death and resurrection. And so the second fact of a life lived in Christ represents that the sin debt has been canceled. The brokenness caused by sin has been restored. Again, we, we understand the purpose of the cross, and now we understand that our sin has been canceled, and we've been restored to God. This is what we understand, and this becomes the the truth from which we live our lives if we truly are in Christ. Third fact of a life lived in Christ. To be in Christ indicates that Christ's righteousness has been substituted. Oh, this becomes so important. To be in Christ indicates that Christ's righteousness has been substituted for our own failed attempts at being right with God. We can never be perfect on our own. And, and the Bible teaches that when our faith becomes placed in Christ, his righteousness lays over our failed attempts to be right with God. And that becomes a fact for us if our faith is in Christ. So the third fact of a life lived in Christ is we live from the truth that Christ's righteousness has been substituted for our own failed attempts. I cannot tell you how significant this becomes for you and for me. And there's a fourth fact of a life lived in Christ. To be in Christ signifies that our faith is placed not in ourselves, but in the work of Christ, meaning what he accomplished on the cross and through the empty grave. To be in Christ signifies that our faith is placed not in ourselves, but in the work of Christ. Therefore, no measurable attempt at being like Jesus could ever result in our own attempt at righteous at a righteous standing with God. So being right with Jesus and being like him is never a result of you and I attempting a righteousness on our own. Our faith, oh, this is so important, is placed in the work of Christ, not in our own works of, of goodness. There's a fifth fact of a life lived in Christ. And I love this. To be in Christ becomes a testimony that Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is in us, transforming us from the inside out because of what Jesus has done. He said, I'll send, I'll send a comfort. I'll send the Holy Spirit. God's presence, the Holy Spirit, is within us. And because of his presence in us, we are being transformed. If we will, if we will follow the the movement of the Spirit in our lives and the teachings of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit quickens our hearts to understand the truth of Christ and the gospel and the counsel of God's Word, then we are being transformed from the inside out. Oh, yes, Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is transforming us 
This becomes a fifth fact of a life lived in Christ. Not in your own goodness, not simply striving to be a good person or to be like Jesus, but actually living in Christ. The Holy Spirit in us is transforming us from the inside out. And there's a sixth fact of a life lived in Christ. Well, this is so important. To be in Christ testifies to the Lordship of Christ over our lives. We live for Him, for He has become the ultimate affection of our heart. Well, this mirrors the study that we just completed in Psalm 105 concerning our seeking God's presence. Jesus becomes the chief, the ultimate affection of our heart. And so to be in Christ testifies to the Lordship of Jesus over our lives. We're not living compartmentalized where Jesus takes Lordship only when we're together with other Christians, where Jesus takes Lordship only when we are asked to speak a good word for him. No, the Lordship of Christ over our life becomes so because we are living in response to the love Jesus has for us, and he becomes our chief affection. And we gladly say, Jesus, you are, you are Lord. And what an exciting message uh, this becomes for, for you and for me uh, today. Uh, in our service here on site, uh, here at the church, a young man will be baptized. I had the privilege of listening to him say not long ago that he's, he's ready to give his whole life over to Jesus, and he's done that in his heart, and is being baptized to demonstrate that. And, and I love the statement, if, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I, I've watched as, as many have made this commitment, and as this young man has recently said, I give my whole life to Jesus. I want him... To be in control of my life, I surrender to him. Oh, to be in Christ is to say, Jesus, I surrender to your lordship. And then a seventh fact of a life lived in Christ. Our hearts surrendered to his love. Our hearts surrendered to his love that, uh, that has overcome the worst of our sins. Oh, to be in Christ daily keeps us surrendered to the love that Christ poured out for you and for me as his death and resurrection, his love, covered the worst of our sins. Oh, living in Christ. What a, uh, what a beautiful picture we have in Scripture that, that if we're in Christ, we are a new creation. The new creation has come because of what Jesus has done. The old is gone. The new is there. So again, we ask you this question of which best defines your life right now? Striving to be like Christ or in Christ? Don't just attempt to do good things because that's what Jesus does or said. Now that's important. Keep striving. But don't just do that. That's not simply who you are. You are actually in Christ. You have his righteousness. You have his Holy Spirit inside of you, changing you from the inside out. You have him with you. You have his love pouring in you spiritually through your life. Respond to him. He's your chief affection. Surrender to his lordship, to his authority, to his rule and reign over all things. Allow who Christ is to be the reason that you respond to live for him. Not simply striving, but you're focusing on the status that Jesus gave you with God through his death and resurrection. You're being made right with God. You are completely brand new and right with God and not fully perfect and not fully like Jesus until we're there. And we continue to strive here, but our striving builds upon our status. We're made brand new. We're not just aimlessly striving to do good things, hoping that the good things outnumber the bad. No, no, no. We, we, when our faith is in Christ, are given that status, that rightness with God because of the righteousness of Jesus that is laid on us. And then God is able to say, I accept you as my son and my daughter. Oh, what a beautiful picture we have in the scriptures concerning what it means to be in Christ. This becomes uh, our identity. Okay, how about a fun story? A fun story meaning that this story will help us in a very uh, endearing way to understand what it means to be in Christ, our identity. Uh, so in his book, Identity Matters, Christian author Terry Worrell tells a story from his childhood. Terry, when he was a child, had a hand-me-down, fix-up, big, blue Schwinn bike. But it was a girl's bike, evidently handed down from an older sister. One day, his mom finally let him venture outside 
uh, from his own neighborhood. He rode away from his little neighborhood on this uh, hand-me-down blue girl's Schwinn bicycle. And as uh, Terry was riding in his newfound freedom, he came across a small one-lane bridge that he had walked across many times. As he pedaled his bike across this bridge, he saw four teenage boys standing on the other side of the bridge. Terry intended to pass by their intimidating stare, so he continued pedaling. But one of the bigger boys reached out, grabbed the handlebar of the bike, spun Terry and his blue Schwinn around, and then he said, hey kid, where do you think you're going? The other boys chimed in, yeah, who do you think you are? Well, there stood Terry trembling by his blue girl Schwinn's bike, and finally one of the bullies said, What's your name, kid, in a very intimidating voice? Terry responded, Terry Worrell. The teenage boys became silent. They looked at one another nervously. And then one of the bullies asked, Are you related to Tom Worrell? You see, Tom was a much older cousin of Terry, who happened to be the all-star defensive end on the high school football team. Terry said, Yes, he's my brother. He was actually Terry's cousin, but at the moment, Terry thought brother sounded better. The boys immediately backed off. One of the boys who had grabbed Terry by his t-shirt straightened out his shirt and said, Hey, we were just funning you. No harm intended. You're a great kid. And if anyone ever gives you trouble, you tell us. We'll take care of you. Terry later commented, That was a formative day for me. For life demands much more than simply being me. You see, dear friend, I want you to know if your faith is in Christ, you have someone behind you. You have someone inside of you. You have someone around you. If your faith is in Jesus, you are in Christ. He represents your identity. You don't just have to rely on being you against all of the challenges in this life that can bully against you. You have something greater than just being you. You are in Christ. And if you and I simply live according to us, there will always be great trouble if we live just according to our identity. But if we can truly live our lives in Christ, then oh, there will be incredible victories and, and the bullying challenges of this life will have no effect on us. Oh, what a beautiful picture of identity. We are in Christ. So we have these two questions today. Are you seeking God with all your heart? And which best defines you? Striving to be like Jesus or being in Christ? I pray that you are seeking God with all of your heart, but don't assume so. Allow these truths we've looked at to test your heart. Allow these truths to examine your heart. I hope you're not just striving to be a good person like Jesus. I hope you truly know that you're in Christ, if your faith is in Christ. And I pray you're not living by your own identity as your only way of doing life. I pray that you're truly living by the identity of Jesus. The Bible declares your status. You are in Christ. You are in Him. So it's not about your personal status in the world. It's about you're, you're standing with God through Jesus that has been purchased for you through the cross. And if your faith is in Jesus, you're in a right standing with God. Jesus becomes your identity. So while we are on a journey to answer five incredibly important questions, we've answered two today. We'll, we'll address three more next week. These five questions of self-examination, maybe subtitled, Five questions we may be afraid to ask, but all oh, these are so important. Are you seeking God with all of your heart? And are you simply trying to be like Jesus? Or are you truly in Christ? Thanks for being with us for this time of teaching. I look forward uh, to sharing with you uh, three other questions the next time we're together. But until then, I'll keep striving to keep your focus steadfast on Jesus Christ. Now, I, I assume that, um, that many people who hear a message like this will, will simply give a nod and say, okay, I'll, I'll try to do better. Oh, I'm praying that you'll do more than this. I'm praying that you will, at this moment, 
Reconcile your life with Jesus and be honest with yourself. Are you truly living for him? Or have you become compartmentalized? Or would you say, hey, I'm just doing religious things. Maybe you've never truly placed your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us there's no way to the Father. And if we deny that and leave this world without peace with God, then we'll be eternally separated from God forever. But through faith in Christ, we can be brought to God. And our eternal life is forever with you and I in the presence of Christ our Lord and in the presence of God. How can we say no to that when that truth becomes a reality right before us? So I pray that you've had a fresh glimpse of God's love for you through Jesus Christ. And I pray your faith is in Jesus. If not, you can pray, Jesus, I believe in you. I trust you. Today, Jesus, I, I surrender my life to you and I place my faith in you and I want to live for you. Would you forgive me of my sin? I trust you. You can pray that now. And I know because scripture says clearly that this will happen. If you place your faith in Jesus, God hears that prayer. He sees your heart. He, he knows your, your desire and he will save you. He will redeem you and change you and bring you into that relationship with him. And oh, there's nothing greater. There is nothing greater. I assure you, the scripture assures you. So, hey, thanks for being with us today. Five questions of self-examination. We'll, we'll look at more of these next week. Until then, again, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Love you a lot. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for meeting us here. Guide us from this point forward. For those who have never placed their faith and trust in you, God, may they do so. And may today be a day of salvation for them. For those who are walking with you and know you, Father, may their faith be strengthened. May these self-examining questions strengthen our faith. Give us a real good look at ourselves, Father, an honest look, so that we know how we, uh, we need to, to give you full control of our lives. God, thank you for your love for us. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Hey, there's a website location on the screen right now. Use that and reach out to us if you will. I'd love to have some conversation with you through email or through any other way that we can. We want to encourage you in your faith. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you've heard the gospel presented today. We want to show you, lead you through scripture, how you can place your faith in Jesus and know for certain that you truly have a relationship with our God, our loving God, who gave his son for us. Hey, thanks again for being here. We'll see you next week. God bless. Hey everyone, just wanted to let you know about an upcoming Love Your City opportunity. Join us Saturday, June 19th from 10 a.m. to noon as we help our friends at Adopt-A-Block serve families in the Cape Charles community. For more information or to sign up, check out this week's At A Glance. We would love the opportunity to share more about this wonderful ministry if you have questions. Looking forward to serving with you as we love our city. Hey guys, the next Nobleman Breakfast is Saturday, June 19, which will be the last one until the fall. We're taking July and August off. This month, Tony Evans is going to talk about no more compromising your integrity. Men, we all have a target on our backs and the enemy seeks to drag us down every day. We cannot stumble and keep our witness. We're gonna eat at eight o'clock, watch the teaching video, and then have our discussion. We'll be out the door by 9.30. Take time to join the Noble Man Group so you can keep up with events and dates and resources to help you become the man of God you were designed to be. If you're a student that's finishing up 7th to 12th grades, let's celebrate the end of this really weird school year with a school's out party at Apex. We're going this Saturday night from 6.30 to 9 o'clock. There's going to be bowling, arcade time, lots of time to hang out with your friends, and of course, food. Chicken tenders, quesadillas, sliders, mozzarella sticks. Need I say more? Invite your friends, but be sure to let me know if you're going by today so I can reserve your spot. The cost is $25. Be sure to check out the Student Ministry Newsletter for information about transportation, departure, and return times. Don't be that kid that misses the bus or the kid that's waiting on the curb for your parents. We hope you're planning to join us to celebrate school being out. We are looking forward to kicking off our summer together. Thank you.